Happy Saturday, everybody. My name is Renee Q. Boating, and I'm so excited about today. You're welcome to the Today's Women Show. And it's going to be really, really exciting and intriguing. You're going to learn so much. It's great you're on here. We'll be right back. It's time for the woman on the move. She's a hard-working lady. She's got her goal. She's pressing on towards it. Let's see who she is. Will I make it through? The pain is slowly creeping. So there's nothing I can do. A body in a circle. Effie Stern has lived with this pain for 20 years. She goes through this unbearable pain each month, not knowing if she will survive it. The pain she goes through started at an early age of eight, but delay in taking her to the hospital for diagnosis worsened her situation. Herbal medicines became an option as she gulped them down monthly to ease her pain. Gradually, she was burying her womb and digging her grave without knowing. She got married and became pregnant for the first time, but lost her pregnancy. It was until then that she realized that she was not just suffering from severe menstrual pain, but had a condition called endometriosis. After losing seven pregnancies to this disease, she finally ended a seven-month term of carrying triplets who did not live. My last pregnancy was a miracle. I had seven, I had um, triplets and I delivered because uh, they were going to um, take them out about seven months. So I had two weeks to seven months and my water broke and I had still bed. So they were alive. But they all died one after the other. No one day. Within the day, about seven days, ten days interval, they died. If it says on a daily basis, she's faced with the pain of being referred to as a barren woman, even after carrying three babies to term through IVF. She shares her struggles discrimination from society and constant pain um, and even this still people don't see you as a woman sometimes I remember when I got back and my mom was trying to um, console me and talk to me and there was a woman around and she was like say no dear and yet uh no boy and fan cast but don't assume you know every, you know somebody so well so you can tell like oh on who you ain't you know a be a on person be who even though she has undergone three surgeries it has come at a cost, which has not in any way brought an end to her troubles. Today, Effie, through all the challenges, did not give up, but has started a campaign on social media to educate people on the dangers of endometriosis. When you have endo, you bloat. Sometimes you bloat. Sometimes my stomach looks like five months pregnant woman. You know, I remember when my husband was alive, sometimes people would be like, oh, congratulations. And I remember one time, a friend of mine came to tell me that, oh, your friend says every day you are pregnant, but you, your baby never comes. We have to tell our story for you to know that, you know, you can't get it unless you have it. You know, so it's hard. I have been... Um, diagnosed with PTS, a whole lot of depression stuff. You know, sometimes I get frozen brain. Sometimes I don't even like myself. 
But when I hear somebody saying they don't like me, I laugh because sometimes I don't like myself. It is estimated that the crippling disease affects 176 million women around the world. Doctors and researchers have still not been able to determine the causes. Their cause is not known. There are a lot of things that we think contribute, but then we don't, there are no specific risk factors that we can say that if you avoid one, two, three, you will not get endometriosis, or if you do ABC, you will get endometriosis. The only thing we know is that sometimes it tends to run in families. And so if you have endometriosis, it is very likely that your sister will get it or that your daughter will get endometriosis. So it tells us that there may be some genetic component attached to it. But really, we, don't, we can't pinpoint and say that this is the definite cause. But research shows that when there is a hereditary link, the disease seems to be worse in the next generation. Reproductive techniques have improved generally, even in our country. So there are a lot of options available. Sometimes just by doing certain things or by the doctor giving certain drugs to just to increase the chances of a pregnancy, it works. When that doesn't work, there are options like IVF, which is even though expensive, but it's available in our country. We have people going for surrogates and all things like that. Okay? So those are some of the things that could be done to tackle infertility. But then too, if it's diagnosed early, then treatments can be put in place to minimize the damage. So our winning woman for today is Mrs. Na Angele NT. She is an amazing woman. She is. She's the owner of Guarding to Plate. You're very welcome. Thank you. I'm so glad to have you today. And I'm so, like I said, I'm so intrigued by your story. And you have to tell us all about it. So Mrs. Na Angele NT, she's a biochemist turned farmer. And we're going to learn all about that whole journey. So you're very welcome again. Thank so you. So tell us about it. I mean, how did you get to biochemistry? <laughs> I, I was a natural science student um, and I always thought I'd actually be a doctor. I okay. always wanted to do medicine, um, but life has different parts and I ended up in the UK after doing my A-levels and I went into biochemistry because I'd had a stint at police hospital doing um, in the lab, medical lab at police hospital after my um, did national service for a bit in Ghana before I went to the UK. Okay. And I'd worked in the medical lab at police hospital and I was fascinated. So I got to the UK and I went to do biochemistry, did a bit of clinical biochemistry. But after a while, I realized it wasn't me. Really, um, what was it? Yes, um, I like being around people. Research is very singular. You mm. do collaborate with people. Mm -hmm. um, and even though I'm an introvert to a large extent, I still also like having, like having, that kind people, of, around. having people around. So, it was one of those things, and I'd done a joint degree in biochemistry and man management, and okay. I loved the management side. Okay. So I found myself going more towards that. Mm. Um, and I finished, and I got a graduate trainee program with Sainsbury's. Okay. So I worked around food. Um, I worked around supply management, um, buying, um, being able to buy, thing, um, buy produce into the company, mm. um, marketing. It was a series of many. I worked for five years and I moved around a lot. Okay. And then from there, I went to Royal Mill and I did operation strategy. Um, so I, worked, I, I ended up being in a corporate space. Mm -hmm. But um, we ha I got married and I had two boys. And my husband had always said, when we have children, I want my children to grow up in Ghana. Okay. So there'd always been this thing at the back of our mind that we will move back to Ghana. And it so was you got a, married in the UK? I got married in the UK. Mm -hmm. I got married in 2002. Mm -hmm. um, and, but I didn't have children till later on. Mm -hmm. And my husband had always said that. So at the back of my mind, I knew we were coming to yeah. Ghana. I just couldn't wrap my head around it. He was more prepared for it. So the boys came to Ghana. They got a place in GIS. Okay. They came to Ghana and they started school. And I had this crazy life where I was flying back and forth. Mm. So every 12 weeks I'd be in Accra. When they are on holiday, they'll come and be with right. me. And I had this crazy lifestyle going back and forth. Mm. 
come 2012, my children are growing up, they're in Ghana, and my husband is like, we have to make a decision. You know, if you don't want to come, the children have to come back. Mm -hmm. And I asked my older son, do you want to come back to the UK? And he was very clear, no, mum. No. No. Yay! Yay! <laughs> he was very clear. He said, Mommy, I don't want to come to the UK. I want to grow up in Ghana. I have Aww. my cousins. I love my school. Yeah, I family. love the people well, I am with. Um, I'd rather go to the UK on holiday. Oh, so wow. that At that age. At that age. He could make that decision. He made that decision. So it just really, I'm so glad he that was you asked seven. your son. Yes. And ladies, we are all learning. We yeah. pick different things from the stories and we mm -hmm. learn from. Mm -hmm. And one thing that I've picked now is that mothers, it's so, so important to mm -hmm. ask our children, Absolutely. you know, for their opinions, not Abs just put it on them. Absolutely. We are moving here. We are going here. Absolutely. We are going there. You Absolutely. know, so they, they love growing up as well Absolutely. that's amazing and and even if his decision was not the same as my decision at least he had been heard yeah and that was the most he important spoke. he spoke yeah at least he had a voice mm. and if my decision was going to be different i would have had a discussion with him and i, mm. I would have told him why right. i was going against what his right. decision was right. but it's dialogue is always mm. important with mm. your children i was lucky um, I had a father who was amazing, his mm. past, but my father would have dialogue. There were four girls, no, we had three girls and one boy, mm. but the girls were made to feel they were as good as the boy. Yeah. And the boy was not, even though he was an only boy, he was never made to think he was better, better than anyone else. Yeah. And dialogue, dialogue, dialogue. So I learned that. Mm. I learned that from my father. Mm. Um, you know, my mother was a baby before complain. <laughs> <laughs> she probably killed me for that. <laughs> Hi, mom. <laughs> but, you know, my dad always had a dialogue, so I'd learned that. Um, so I made the decision. It was hard for me. It was very, very hard. So what for was hard about it? Was it leaving your work there and coming? Or leaving what, what my was work. It? it was for me. I think you get to a stage where your validation, for some of us, we get to a point where validation is in our roles. Mm -hmm. It's okay. the job we do. Right. It's where right. we are. And I had climbed the corporate ladder. Mm. So it was a difficult a decision. It was a huge sacrifice. And also a sacrifice where I didn't know what I was coming to do to, in Ghana. Mm. I didn't know what I was coming to. I mean, I'd been coming on holiday. But remember, I would have been away for about 25, 28 years before this decision was made. Wow. So it was a lifetime away from Ghana. Mm. Um, the Ghana I left was no longer the Ghana I was Same. coming back to. And I didn't know what I was coming to do. And I think for me, that was the um, mm. worst thing. So I made a decision that the first year, I wasn't going to work. I was going to be a stay-at-home mom because the boys had been away from me for a while. Yeah. And I wanted to give them 110%, be there, go to school with them, do all the school things with them. Mm. So I came to Ghana with no plan. Wow. And the other reason why it was difficult for me was I knew my mom would struggle with it. Mm. You know, my dad had passed and I felt that my dad actually would have taken it better than my mom. mom. Yes, my dad would have taken... Really? Yes. Your mom being a, a woman? My mom had always brought us up that... Um, she had always said this thing to me, that never be housewife. So when I was oh. growing up, because my mom was a housewife and my dad got ill and she always felt that if she had worked, life and would have been smoother. Okay. So she always told me not to be a housewife, okay. all of us. She okay. always told us, don't be a housewife. Have a career. Is it just, yes, to, to be able to get some income? Yes. Okay. So she always said, have a career, have something, have your own life, have an income. And she always said, it's not because your husband may not be able to look after you, but so that if something happens, something you can step back, yeah. into the gap and mm, brace the family. Right. So I had grown up with this thing that I wasn't going to be a housewife. Mm. And my siblings, like my, my sisters are like that. Mm. We're brought up not to think about being a housewife. Mm. So telling her I was leaving my job in oh, the UK, wow. I'm moving to Ghana, and her next question was going to be, what, what are, are you, you coming to, to do? do? <laughs> and I'm saying, nothing. I'm going to be a housewife. It was very difficult. Mm. But I mustered the courage, and I told her. And I know I disappointed her. I know she was disappointed. But it was for a moment. It wasn't like you were, you, were, you know. Absolutely, just, yeah. absolutely. And I mean, she's come around, you know, it was for the moment. And I don't regret it because I think it was the best decision for my boys. No regrets whatsoever. I mean, I do have twinges of regret from there now and yeah. then as a normal human being, yeah. but I have no regrets. But I have to say it. congratulations. Thank you. I mean, for you to make that decision, Thank you. it's a life changing, totally. I mean, for the positive or for the negative, totally. you know, and for you to have that, was it, would, I, for me, I'll, I'll make that decision even based on a certain kind of faith. Oh. And a certain kind of like sort of totally. hope, belief totally. that, you know, because otherwise. Totally. totally. So, you know, I'm a Christian. Um, I love I love my God and 
God had taken me through so much mm. that my faith was strong. I didn't know what I was coming to do in Ghana, but I remember someone asking me, um, a friend asking me, oh, so you're moving to Ghana, what are you going to do? And I said to him, I said, you know something, the God I serve moved me to England, very little family, and I survived and I rose my goodness, I'm going home. Yeah. What can God do exactly. in my own home? You know, so I had faith. I had faith. I didn't know what it was going to be, but I had faith that it would all be to my good. It will work together for my good. Oh, that was so, so, so emotional. Um, this is a toast to you. To you. You are amazing, I think. Mm -mm. Thank you. Mm. Mm, I love this. This is Aztec. And mm. I think yours is a lemon, lemon iced tea. tea. So you see, they gave you... The lemon iced tea, because of your link to farming, huh? <laughs> I got you there. This is from the one-to-one -one bar here at the Mobin Pick Ambassador Hotel. Lovely cocktails all the time. So, Auntie, now I'd like you to tell us a bit about getting to plate. So then how did that come in? So I moved to Ghana in 2012, and I struggled with the vegetables I was getting. Mm. Um, when I was growing up, my mom came. My mother is very fussy, so she never bought lettuce. She always had this thing about why is lettuce in Ghana grown by the gutter? So this is like yes. 30 something years ago. My so mother, it's the same. It's, the it's same. still, the same, it's still yeah. the same. So my mom actually grew her own lettuce at the back of the house. Okay. Um, or she will find people who were doing it in their homes and she'll get them to give her some. So I always had this thing that, you know, why would I eat lettuce grown by the gutter? So I actually don't eat salads out of my house as a rule. Wow. Um, unless Not even in restaurants or nope. anything? Because you don't know where... where <laughs> because I don't know where it's coming from. Okay. Um, unless the vegetables are cooked, I wouldn't eat mm. the vegetables. So I would come to Ghana even on holiday and I'll bring my lettuce. And if it was finished, it was finished. We didn't eat salads. But I was craving for it. So I was... I moved into a house that had a, ha a large garden. And I was putting grass down and I got to the back of the house and I thought, this is crazy. Why am I growing green grass? Mm. Let's grow some lettuce. So it started with lettuce and cabbage. And, and I wasn't was it just like as a hobby? I was growing it to eat. Okay. There was no business plan. Garden to plates was not even anywhere in my head. Wow. Um, I was going to eat and I was growing more than I could eat. Mm. So I was giving it away. Mm. I'd go to my children's school and the parents were my friends. I'd say, would you like some lettuce? Would you like some cabbage? <laughs> <laughs> and I would give it away. But the constant message I got from people was that, nah, this is so good. You must do this and have a business out of it. And I am like, really? And this is where education can be a barrier. Mm. So I'm like, really? All this education, all this <laughs> time? Know, right? <laughs> and you, th I mean, I'm a biochemist. I'm a bio I mean, you know, at least I could be coaching. I mean, what are you people talking about? I mean, yeah, growing lettuce. Growing lettuce. I mean, and what, going around a crowd with a bag of lettuce <laughs> and asking people <laughs> to buy lettuce? Mm, I don't think so. So it took a long time. It took a year for me to wrap my head around wow. it because the message from people was constant, mm. you know, from my family. It was just a constant message. Wow. You really have to think bigger. You really mm. have to do this as a business. So, and especially as, you know, you couldn't find the kind that you wanted. I couldn't so if find you're growing what you wanted, maybe the other people like you who needed Absolutely. it. So it was probably a niche in the market. It was a yes, niche in the yes. market, but I wasn't ready for that message. Mm. So it took a year. And eventually I decided I was going to do this. So I grew... I expanded the number of beds I had mm -hmm. and I grew some letters and I started giving it again I gave it away that was my marketing strategy right. was if I did this and I was selling it would you buy it right so I gave away everybody's first bag was free mm -hmm. and the question was if I did this would you buy it mm -hmm. and it was a unanimous yes, yes. we'll buy so that's how Garden to Play wow. started um, so it started small I was, it was three people, myself, a gardener, and my driver who loved farming as well, the gentleman who drove me, and he would also But how pity. did you know how to? I'd always loved gardening. So gardening came naturally. I was mm -hmm. gardening anyway. Okay. I just wasn't growing food. Okay. So the gardening part was easy. But the thing was, I love cooking. Mm. So I cook a lot. And so I understand what works. I understand right. what herbs to grow and that mm. kind of thing. So really, I tell people that this is my own love affair with my cookery. <laughs> and then I share it with people. Right. Um, so that's how it started. And my husband was an amazing supporter. He's been my number one fan. Hi. 
Hello, hello, <laughs> he's, hey. he's been my number one fan. Uh, you know, he's invested in my business. Um, he talks about my business probably more than I talk oh, about my business. Um, and so really, truly, uh, his encouragement has been second to none. Um, Another tip here, men watching, promote <laughs> your wife's businesses. Absolutely. And promote them, promote them. They are your queens. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, we have to give a toast to Mrs. <laughs> no, 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 no. We have to, to you, Peter. To, to you, to you. <laughs> Lovely. That's really, really nice. Um, so that's how Garden to Plates was born. Um, so it started small in a small part of the garden and it grew by word of mouth. Mm. So we have the best kind of, uh, uh, you know, advertising. So people are talking from experience. People are talking from experience. So it's grown by word of mouth. We've never advertised. Never. Uh, never advertised. Um, and our, our motto is we let the taste do the talking. Right. That's our motto. Right. We let the taste do the talking. Mm -hmm. So we don't talk a lot about it. We don't go. And literally, it's a business that's grown by word of mouth. I mean, I have tried it. But, so I'm looking at you like in awe because I have tasted, I've seen your vegetables. They, you remember I asked you, do you do this? yourself yes you do. i mean now i love the packaging thank you i love how they look and how they, they are clean thank i you. mean you look at it out of the bag and you feel like you can eat it of course you have to wash it yeah. and everything yeah. but it's really important as well for for farmers out there generally for Absolutely. those selling food especially raw foods i mean a lot of the time they think that just because it's raw so take it dirty go and clean it Absolutely. yourself but the packaging and presentation Absolutely. alone and everything was well i'm a i'm a, I'm a I'm a branding coach, Absolutely. so maybe that's how I'm going on and on. Yeah. But it's so, so, so yeah. important because yeah. that as well speaks. Yeah. The sweet peppers, I've been meaning to ask you, do you, do you grow No, the those? sweet peppers, we try, sometimes we do, but these are imported. These come okay. from Holland, so okay. these are not grown. And right. it, we actually state, so what we do is we tell people what we've grown and what what, what we, okay. we haven't grown. So okay. it, we state it very, very okay. clearly. So, so the lettuce and the cabbages and all that, how, I've never known how, uh, is it seeds? So or? I grow them from seed. From seed, we okay. We nurse them. We nurse them from seed and then we transplant them. Okay. Uh, but what we've done is, um, even though the, the garden is in the house, mm -hmm. it's a lot of space. Mm -hmm. So we've, we have a lot of beds and one of the things we've done is we have drip irrigation. So okay. we've kind of made it more scientific, more um, using all the different scientific methods that there are. We, we have a cultivator, for instance, so oh, we wow. don't use the whole to turn oh, the soil. Okay. We cultivate until okay. we have a tiller, which is run by petrol. It's a small one and it's meant for small gardens and small farms, you know. We, we do our own compost. So we have two compost um, bins mm. and we, we compost everything. Um, because it's, once I was doing it, I decided to do it organic. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. whatever, oh, so it's I, organic. whatever I grow oh, is organic. Wow. Okay, I do fantastic. not, I, I only use chicken manure. I compost myself um, and we use drip irrigation. We use nets to stop insects from getting to, mm. the, um, to the plant. And the other thing we are doing is we're looking at things that actually are natural to Ghana that most people don't eat. So my, my gardener is an amazing gardener who, in, he's a Northner, and he introduces me to all these amazing leaves that mm. they eat, that nobody, you know, so one of those things is a leaf, or it's called amaranth, green amaranth. Okay. And there's actually red amaranth, which is eaten in Asia and everything. That's sweeter than a leafu. Okay. But a leafu has amazing... What would um, you use that for? They use it for soups. Okay. Some people use it for... They just um, steam it as a green. Okay. Some, I know some people okay. use younger leaves and they um, use it in their smoothies. Okay. But everybody has this hang-up about kale. Mm. And a leafu has, mm. you know, equally... Powerful thing, yeah. as and is it bitter? Because kale it's, can be a bit like yeah, bitter. it's a, it, it's it's a, it's a bit astringent. Okay, but you know, if you put a little bit, you probably won't taste okay. it. Okay, okay, you probably won't taste it. So he's introduced me to things like that, which you know, That's so fantastic. yeah. So we're yeah. doing all sorts of things. You know, we're trying not to be like everybody else. And the thing about cleanness, I guess that's where all the years in Sainsbury's came mm, to play. Yeah. So I had so worked... it never went to waste. Yes. You were and probably that just is being the story I, word... Yeah. That's, that's yes. where I want to come to that. You know, what I learned was that nothing you do is wasted. Please tell the ladies that. You have nothing, to tell them. <laughs> nothing you do is wasted. Um, what I've learned is that everything is a journey. And everything you do one day, you, you, will, you will learn. You will, you will use it. What you have to do is give it your best. Mm. So when I mentor, I tell people, you know, when you're in that office and you're giving the other one who's the runner doing all those jobs, do it with your heart, do it with your soul, do it well and learn. You know, the person may think they're using you, but it's a learning opportunity exactly, for you. Exactly. Because, you know, as the Bible says, 
the person who is faithful with little will be faithful with much. Yes. So if you think it's someone's job or someone's business and you're running it down and you think when you have your own, you're going to wake up early and get to work early, you so will not. Because you haven't taught yourself how to do that. Mm, you don't know exactly. that. It's not a habit. Yeah. You know, you don't know how to wake up and be on time and get there on time. You don't know that if I'm going late, let me just call and let them know let that I'm going know. to be late. Yeah. Because that's not what you do. Mm. You'll do the same thing with mm. your business and your clients will be upset with you. Mm. So nothing I learned got wasted, you know, in the packaging. That's why a lot of thought went into the packaging. A lot of thought went into even the name for it. Mm. You know, the Garden to Plates yes, was because yes, yes, yes. the idea was that it had to be fresh. And so we harvest 24 hours and it's on your plate. Mm. It's one of the reasons I'm not in shops. Um, okay. Because I didn't want it to be something that you would go into the shop and it had been on the shop floor for three mm. days, four days. Because mm. by that point, it's not going to be fresh. Right. It's not going to be crisp. The taste is going, change, it, yeah. it will change. Mm. Clean water was very important as well because most of the vegetables are water. So if you put cabbage in a pan and you put it on the stove, half of it yes, is going to be water. Yes. So if the water is not good quality, mm. it affects the taste. Mm. So we, I took all of those things into consideration and a lot of thought went into Garden wow, to plates. Wow. <laughs> now people say um, farming is expensive. Is that true? You know, when it comes to your pricing and all that, because I mean, listening to everything that you're saying, this is your own personal garden. Look at all the things that you put into it. It's organic. You, you use all your manure, all of that. Are you able to sort of, you know, how are you able to do your pricing? So, um, I and I'm just asking this for business, for, you know, for, for mm. probably ladies out there thinking, because some women, you know, have ideas, yeah. but they are also thinking about the profit yeah. before, before, you know, they've been put into plan. Yeah. So sometimes they're like, oh, no, if I won't make a lot of money, then, you know, so, but I'm asking this for the business people mm. out there, for the mm. entrepreneurs, mm. maybe, you know, so maybe you could give a little bit of advice mm. on how mm. to sort of position and structure your business mm. for pricing. Yeah. So I think mm. you need to know what the main costs are and you need to work out how much you're going to sell to make, um, to, to even break even. Right. And for me, I think, I think I approach this slightly different. For me, the love of it overwhelms how much was the yes. fulfillment. So the fulfillment is that for me, it's not really so much up my money. But, you know, because I love what I do, because I'm so passionate about what I do, to be honest, I do make money out of it. Mm -hmm. You know, money that at the moment, a lot of it is reinvested back right. into the business because, again, drip irrigation is not cheap. Mm -hmm. So if you're putting mm -hmm. drip irrigation in, you're putting quite a lot of money right. into it. Um, but, you know, pricing was worked. And, and the margins on farming are small. Mm. So one of the things I say to people is you must know your worth. Right. You must really know your worth. You must know what this business is worth. Mm -hmm. You must know what your costs are and price it accordingly. Right. One of the things I was keen on doing was not to overprice it. Mm -hmm. Because with a lot of businesses in Ghana, what I realized is that um, people always think of the expat market. You know, I want, ex you know, my experts are the ones who are going to buy. I was keen that I had Ghanaian consumers mm. as well. So I priced it such that I asked myself, would I buy it? Right, at this price. Would I buy it at mm. this price? And if I would buy it at this price, then... I think most people would buy mm, it at that price. Mm. So that's how I thought about the yeah. pricing. And then, you know, there's some things that will make me more money than others, you know. So the pricing kind of squares out, you know. Some herbs make me more money mm. than other herbs would right, make me, right. um, you know. And I also try to grow unusual things. So mm. at the moment, we are growing fresh turmeric. I mean, listen, let me catch you here. Women are probably watching and thinking, where can I get it? How can I get it? So you're not in the shops. So then how, how, can, how can we get it? I mean, if I want it. If you want it, then we do it on an order basis. So okay. you order on a Monday or a Thursday mm -hmm. and you collect it on a Tuesday or on a Friday. Okay. Where, where would you collect it from? You collect it from Cross Train um, Wellness Centre, which is near the American ah, Embassy. Yes, yes, I know it. Yeah, it's yeah. near the American Embassy. Mm -hmm. or, or we have it delivered. If you want it delivered, then I have a dispatch rider who would deliver it. But you pay for the delivery, for the delivery. Cost. I have to let me, let me just read all of this okay because she deserves it I mean I just love the fact that I mean look at you you're just a graceful dainty lady <laughs> and you call you're a farmer I call and a lot myself, of the time yeah. farming is attributed to like a strong mm -hmm. men like in the village mm -hmm. you know all of that and everything but the, you're just so soft and you say I'm, I'm, a, I'm a farmer now let me tell everybody everybody has to hear this okay so she's an associate of the Royal College of Science in the UK so what she's talking 
talking about the organic farming. She knows what she's doing. And that's not it. That's not it. She's also a member of the European Coaching and Mentoring Council. So I love that you talked a bit about, you know, mm. mentoring and you were giving advice, you know, on the... And it's just amazing. I can't even go on to talk about your degrees and your accolades <laughs> and everything. I mean, I know. And I think it's just amazing because I've seen you for a while and I just also love your humility. Thank as you. well. So that, you know, I think is just, I wish you all the very, very best. Thank I can't you. thank you enough for coming thank on the you. show. And I hope you watching out there, I hope you've been inspired, you know, to not think that I'm too good for this or that, that my hands can be in soil. Because the soil is probably what is going to bring you the money. So dip your hands in there, do it well, and, you know, it will just speak for itself. So I'm just so proud of you. Thank you so much for coming on. I can't say it enough. And Yaz is one of our sponsors. They push me to bring beautiful women like you, inspiring women like you, to motivate all the women out there. So they have a gift for you, a special gift. Yaz, they do the very popular sanitary um, towels. They do wipes, baby wipes, toothpaste. They're a huge brand. And every week they bring some gifts for me to give to my guests. Oh, wow. So this is a gift from Yaz to you. Just to say thank you so much. We really, really appreciate you. And go, go, go. Thank you. So, so thank you to Yaz. We'll be right back. Thank you. Vaginal steaming is an ancient women's health practice that involves sitting over warm steaming herbs. Current research shows that it is a traditional practice in at least 28 countries worldwide. It is said to cleanse the vagina and uterus, regulate menstruation and ease period cramps and bloating. Although steaming varies from place to place, it is universally used after giving birth. Most often administered by midwives, the popularity of postpartum steaming is highly known. Vaginal steaming, it helps the mother to regain its pre-pregnant state by the uterus coming back to its normal state. And also, if you see after delivery, you get a, lot of, a, a bit of bruises and other things. So we advise that you do that. A lot of people are not really practicing it. I, I, I learned it just recently that um, a celebrity outside just tried it and the person came up with this thing and a lot of people are now going into it. The chief executive started the spa business about a month ago. I am currently going through the vaginal steaming process and I'm sure you may be wondering what a throne and a crown is doing at a vaginal steaming center known as a spa. Well. The throne, which is known as the paltrow, is just to make you feel comfortable while you go through the process. And the crown, to make you feel like the queen that you are. The vaginal steaming process is actually quite simple. It is a mixture of herbs and warm water. What are these herbs that we are talking about? We have the mugworth, we have the donkwai, we have the saffron. And the saffron specifically is an aphrodisiac. The rates for the steaming ranges from 120 to 400 cities depending on how long the person wants to be on the seats. People who practice vaginal steaming believe the herbs can penetrate vaginal tissues and offer a variety of benefits. One of Aisha's clients, Georgina Opon, who learned about vaginal steaming on Facebook, was shocked to find out that something like that existed and decided to give it a try. I choose exotic because I wanted to relax. <laughs> you know, you when you sit on even hot water, you see how you feel. Yeah, so this is beyond even sitting on the hot water. Some men reacted to the steaming process. If it could tighten it for a man to be happy, that one we have no problem. If it's effective, why not? If not, then there's no need for you to even waste time to sit in the warm water or whatever it is called. Gynecologists, however, believe that vaginal steaming is unnecessary since the vagina naturally cleanses itself. Some doctors even 
say that don't do anything in there because you have a natural protection. So yes, there is, but the act of sex and going up and down that route may influence uh, the change of environment and then uh, uh, there could be some infections. According to Dr. Hine Kulabi, there is no scientific evidence to suggest that vaginal semen helps any condition, but could it be harmful? Don't introduce unnecessary things into the vagina. You never know the, the other side of it. Yes, it may help, it may be soothing, it may contain certain ingredients, herbs or whatever, which may be antibacterial or improve the, the pH of the vagina. But it, to be doing it routinely, I, I, I think it's, it's a wrong practice. Dr. Hineku Labi urged women to consult a physician whenever they see any uncomfortable signs around the vagina. Thank you so much for joining me today on the Today's Woman Show. I am so inspired. It's like I'm just going, 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 and I hope you are too. Don't miss it next week, 11 a.m. on TV3 and DSTV channel 279. And I can't do this without my sponsors. I can't thank them enough. Movin Pick Ambassador Hotel, thank you for giving us your set, the one-to-one -one bar for the cocktails. Many thanks to GTP and to Yaz. Thank you so much. You make this happen. Ladies, you heard it all. We are today's woman. There is nothing you cannot do. Keep pushing on, keep pressing, and trust me, you will make it. See you next week. Stay blessed.